speech, uh, you uh, provided some definition of uh, uh, systemic risk and financial stability, which I think uh, are pretty accepted in the <laughs> in the community, policy community, uh, and academia. The problem, uh, however, that I see uh, with these definitions is that uh, it's difficult to, uh, they don't boil down to a measurable, easy to communicate objective. At the moment we want to do macro prudential policy, uh, I think it's sort of necessary to come up somehow to a measurable uh, objective. I understand it's much more difficult to than in monetary policy because uh, inflation uh, is quote unquote sort of easily measurable, while financial stability or, or systemic risk is much more difficult to measure. But uh, that said, I think this uh, should be uh, the effort that uh, we collectively should do. So I would like to hear your opinion about that. I'm mentioning this because uh, in your speech, then uh, you have uh, uh, gave uh, a lot of hints of uh, how certain conditions, say uh, financing conditions, for instance, leverage, could uh, lead to financial instability. Uh, so it would be nice actually to link these uh, hints that you gave to us to again a measurable uh, objective yeah. for financial stability or systemic risk. Yeah. So I, I completely agree with you. Um, so I alluded in the speech, I alluded to the forthcoming GFSR, and this is precisely where we propose a, met a metric for financial stability, which is GDP at risk. Okay, and so GDP at risk. So imagine that you estimate the conditional distribution of GDP growth, you know, one year or two years or three years into the future. So what is, you know. So, say at the IMF, we, we always provide uh, forecasts, uh, which are point forecasts, and then there's some discussion of, of downside risks or so. So, the way that I view financial stability is, uh, or one metric for, for financial stability as a foundation for cyclical macroprudential policy, is to, to measure uh, GDP at risk as a function of financial vulnerability. And um, so in the report we're proposing, we're showing two ways of doing it. One is a statistical way to basically model how the conditional density of GDP growth is moving and, uh, and you can do that at different forecasting horizons. Uh, and you can also use DSG models uh, to generate a conditional distribution. Or uh, something we don't do in the report, but which uh, many central banks are doing, is you can use a, a purely judgmental approach and say there are five scenarios and you put some probability weights on those scenarios. So, so I, I, I completely agree with you that uh, I think we're, you know, to make cyclical macroprudential policy a workable, uh, a workable, something workable, you want to have um, some object, some measurable objective that you can track, and so my proposal would be to track GDP at risk. Thank you, Eva. Thank you very much for a, a really interesting and thorough presentation. I'm Francesco Mattaferro. I'm the head of the Secretariat here at the SRB. Now, the discussion about macroprudential policy started ten years being ago, being very strongly cyclical. Now there was, then there was a phase in which people basically thought does not function. It should be about res accumulating resilience for several reasons. We are not able to foresee the financial cy uh, cycle. And if I want to understand today, you have been bringing us a very strong cyclical message, which uh, I find is extremely interesting. Now, I have three questions concerning the counter-cyclical capital buffer, which you have been mentioning. The first one, do you think in terms of size, the size of capital which would be accumulated or could be released is sufficient to make the trick? The second question is, sometimes people think banks would simply conserve capital because it's costly, even if they get the policy information 
that you can release it. And the third point is we are in a world which is less and less bankocentric, and we do not have cyclical instruments beyond banking. So what do you think about this? Yes. Um, <coughs> so uh, all three questions are very relevant and, and interesting. So of course, the world has changed in the past 10 years. Uh, bank capital globally has increased tremendously. Um, you know, in, in the typical GSIP, um, um, common, you know, some proxy for common tier one equity was somewhere between four and 5% 10 years ago, and this today perhaps, you know, nine or 10% or something like that. So capital is substantially higher than it was uh, 10 years ago. Um, so, so that's a first order difference. And it, it, you know, it, it, it shifts so like the tail risk out quite a bit further. Um, on top of that, you know, of course, there are all kinds of additional buffers depending on the jurisdiction. And the counter cyclical capital buffer can be up to 2.5% on top of it. Now, you know, does, would that protect you against any kind of shock? No, you know, 2.5% is, is a finite number. But I think that, um, say, in the US case, having 2.5% more would have made a, a tremendous difference in the fall of 2008 or the, or the beginning of 2009. It would probably not have prevented a disorderly leveraging but it would certainly have made it less necessary to recapitalize the banking system using uh, TARP money in, in 2009. Um, you know, the other example is, of course, in Spain, uh, where there was uh, the dynamic provisioning, which was of the order of, you know, depending on the banks, uh, of, of a similar order as, as a counter ba capital buffer. And that, of course, was not sufficient to, to counteract uh, the housing crisis as a whole, but still differentially across the banks, those that did accumulate uh, the counter cyclical capital uh, provisioning buffer uh, were cutting their, their credit provision less aggressively once the crisis hit. So I do think it does make a difference. Um, but yes, the calibration, I think, is a, is a very, very uh, um, important question. Now, of course, there, there are trade-offs. I mean, you know, Bank capital uh, is costly to some extent, and they're both intertemporal trade-offs and trade-offs across institutions. Uh, so even the counter cyclical capital buffer might generate regulatory arbitrage into the shadow banking system, or it might uh, shift uh, the temporal allocation of credit. Um, so I, I do believe, even though we are in a, in a in now in a, in a system with much higher equity in the, in the core banks and with stress tests and much, much better regulatory and supervisory framework, I still believe that variations in financial conditions are going to continue and those are going to have first order impacts on credit supply, on credit availability and hands on macroeconomic activity. And so, that's particularly important in the European context because, of course, monetary policy is set centrally. And we might well be, again, in a case like Spain in the run-up to the crisis where, you know, relative to the euro area, monetary policy was set correctly, but relative to one particular country, it might have been much too easy or much too tight. So that, you know, having these extra tools might be extremely, extremely useful and powerful. So thank you very much again. I think uh, it's time for lunch now.